Hey guys, and welcome to How to Gastro. Today we will be talking about gastroesophageal reflux disease, also commonly known as GERD. So let's get right into it. What is gastroesophageal reflux? GERD is when a stomach acid or sometimes stomach content flows back into the esophagus. In doing so, this reflux or backwash causes irritation to the lining of the esophagus and discomfort to the individual. So I have a schematic on the right and you can see the stomach with its acidic content rushing back upwards or refluxing into the esophagus. And the esophagus is normally not an acidic environment at all. So this causes, as you can imagine, a lot of irritation to the lining of the esophagus. So why does GERD occur? Normally, the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a circular band of muscle around the bottom part of the esophagus, relaxes to allow food and liquid to flow down into the stomach and closes to stop food and acidic stomach content from flowing back into the esophagus. In GERD, however, the reflux occurs when the lower esophageal sphincter is weak or relaxes inappropriately, allowing the stomach's content to flow back up into the esophagus. I have an arrowhead showing the lower esophageal sphincter of the esophagus, or it's also commonly known as the LES uh, for my med students out there. And this actually, in normal situation, uh, would prevent the reflux. But here in GERD, we have the sphincter, which is inappropriately relaxing. What are the symptoms of GERD? You can imagine as that acid washes up into the esophagus, it's going to cause some burning. So a burning sensation in the chest, more commonly known as heartburn, sometimes spreading to the throat. We have regurgitation of food or liquid into the mouth from the stomach. We can have belching or more commonly known to us as burping, chest pain, a difficulty in swallowing, uh, for my med students, dysphagia, dry cough, hoarseness or sore throat, sensation of a lump in the throat, and some symptoms of asthma. So what are the risk factors of GERD? Obesity, uh, bulging of the top of the stomach into the diaphragm, which is called a hiatal hernia. And uh, I'll make a separate video on hernias because it's totally different uh, pathology, but it can be GERD related. Pregnancy, smoking, dry mouth, asthma, diabetes, delayed stomach emptying, and also connective tissue disorders such as scleroderma. What are the complications of GERD? So as you can imagine, that rushing acidic content uh, into the esophagus is going to cause some kind of damage to the lining and also irritation. So we have esophagitis, which is inflammation of the esophagus. Uh, we have esophageal bleeding or an ulcer development from the chronic or severe esophagitis. We can have esophageal scarring, which can also cause esophagus to narrow and uh, make swallowing harder, which is called stricturing uh, for my med students. And we can have in time gum problems and tooth decay. Also continuing with complications, we can have respiratory problems such as cough, hoarseness, wheezing, asthma crisis, chronic bronchitis, chronic laryngitis and pneumonia. Uh, we can have in time also the development of Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition. And uh, that's a very important point to note. And uh, in chronic uh, long-standing uh, GERD, we can have the development of esophageal cancer. So how do we make a diagnosis of GERD? We have to have the history of GERD-like described symptoms, and that would be regurgitation, belching, heartburn, bitter taste, gum problems, sore throat, dysphagia, feeling a lump in the throat, asthma or wheezing-like symptoms, chest pain, and hoarseness. So those were the symptoms described earlier as well. And continuing with the diagnosis, the gold standard of GERD is actually the 24-hour esophageal pH testing. And this test monitors the amount of acid in the esophagus by the use of a small probe that is inserted through the patient's nostril and is positioned in the lower part of the esophagus. And in GERD, 
this probe senses a more acidic esophageal environment than normal uh, due to that acidic gastric content that is being refluxed. And on my schematic representation on the right, you can see that yellowish liquid, which is full of hydrochloric acid, uh, brushing up into the esophagus and we can see our monitoring device which is recording the, the pH in the esophagus and that catheter placed uh, with a small probe in it inside the esophagus. Also we can diagnose GERD from barium swallow and the barium swallow is a barium sulfate uh, metallic compound that shows up on x-rays and is used to help see abnormalities in the esophagus and the stomach. When taking the test, you have to drink a preparation containing the solution and the x-rays will track the path through the digestive system. Using the barium swallow test, we could also recognize complications of uh, GERD, that chronic reflux will cause a lot of complications to the esophagus, such as the ulcer, esophageal ulcer, esophageal stricturing, Barrett's esophagus and esophageal cancer. So as you can see on the right side, we have the patient drinking the barium solution. We have a monitor. We have the x-ray machine. We have the patient and we have the radiographer, which is taking the pictures of the esophagus. So I've put in some examples of complications that occur uh, in GERD and this can help us make the diagnosis of GERD. So here is a picture of a barium swallow which shows an esophageal stricture. On the left side you can see a very normal esophagus, no problems uh, there, no strictures, no uh, little ulcers, no inflammation, just a very good normal esophagus. And on the right side you can see a stricture that has developed and the stricture is actually esophageal scarring which can cause the esophagus to get narrow and it makes it very hard to swallow so these patients will also come into the clinic with dysphagia another example of a barium swallow which is showing esophagitis and uh, on the left side again we have our normal uh, esophagus and on the right side we have esophagitis uh, you can see the inflamed esophagus, uh, thick mucosa, and you can see those in white arrows. And the ulcer, which is a collection, uh, you'll see a, a bit of a darkened area, the black arrowhead right there. Uh, you'll be able to see the um, ulcer there, and that is also due to GERD. So we can also diagnose GERD using an esophagoscopy which is a flexible tube to look inside the esophagus and using the scope uh, the scope is just basically a, a little piece of wire with a camera on the end and uh, using the scope we could also recognize complications of chronic reflux such as an ulcer, uh, a stricture, Barrett's esophagus, cancer or we could also use it to rule out GERD and diagnose other uh, esophageal pathologies. Here I have an example uh, of what uh, a gastroenterologist will see when he's performing a esophagoscopy and that's uh, showing on the left a normal esophagus and uh, due to chronic GERD uh, we can see on the right side uh, someone who has developed a Barrett's esophagus and uh, in Barrett's esophagus we have the normal tissue lining the esophagus which is changed to the tissue that resembles the lining of the intestine. And this is very, very uh, important because Barrett's esophagus patients are actually more prone to developing an esophageal carcinoma. So it's actually a precancerous state. So moving on, I'm putting here a picture of an esophagoscopy showing a squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. And this again uh, can be seen with the esophagoscopy by the gastroenterologist. On the left we have a normal esophagus, nice beautiful normal esophagus. On the right you can see a very large uh, pathological tumor, a malignant one, uh, and you can see that the, the lumen of the esophagus has uh, greatly been eaten up by this tumor. Also uh, in the diagnosis of GERD we could use esophageal motility study and uh, this is called manometry 
and uh, it is done to see if the esophagus as well as the lower esophageal sphincter is contracting and relaxing properly and this test helps to diagnose swallowing problems and rule out GERD and in GERD the weak lower esophageal sphincter will cause heartburn and reflux so basically in the beginning I mentioned that in GERD we have a very weak lower esophageal sphincter contraction and because it doesn't contract properly it allows the, the acid to escape the stomach and enter the esophagus so basically these waves on the right hand side from the manometry test with the lower esophageal sphincter the amplitude of those waves will be even less and uh, because it will show a weak uh, lower esophageal sphincter contraction so treatment in GERD uh, in treatment we can advise the patient to do some lifestyle changes such as losing weight if they're overweight uh, avoiding alcohol chocolate citrus fruits and tomato based products avoiding peppermint coffee and the onion family and all these food groups actually cause a more acidic environment in the stomach and of course if we have a more uh, acidic environment in the stomach we're going to have a more acidic environment in the esophagus we can also advise the patient to avoid large meals uh, wait three hours after a meal before they lay down and elevate their head off the bed so part of the medical treatment for GERD um, the initial treatments are aimed at controlling the heartburn so most of the uh, medical treatment for GERD is centered around uh, controlling the heartburn sensation so antacids can neutralize the stomach acid and examples are Malox, Melanta, Gelucil, Gaviscon and Rolades also part of the medical treatment for GERD, we have medications that block acid production and heal uh, the esophagus. And these medications are called proton pump inhibitors or PPIs. And uh, for all my medical students out there, this is actually the most essential drug class that is aimed at treating GERD. So some examples are esomeprazole, lanceprazole, omeprazole, panteprazole, rabaprazole, and dexlanceprazole. We could also use medications to reduce the acid production and these are called H2 receptor blockers, histamine 2 receptor blockers and these medications include cimetidine, formetidine, nizitidine and ranitidine. And something to note is the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors, are actually stronger blockers of acid production than uh, the H2 receptor blockers. Okay. We could also use medications to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter because the main cause of the development of GERD is actually the failure of the lower esophageal sphincter to contract and thus prevent the acidic content from the stomach to, to go into the esophagus. So these medications help to decrease the frequency of the relaxation and uh, therefore decreasing the occurrence of the reflux and drugs such as baclofen are very helpful in this. We also have some surgical interventions which are used to treat GERD and uh, the surgery uh, option here is to reinforce the lower esophageal sphincter such as Nissen fundoplication and uh, this surgery involves tightening the lower esophageal sphincter to prevent the reflux by wrapping the very top of the stomach, the fundus, around the outside of the lower esophagus. So as you can see here, uh, we have a normal stomach on the left and on the right we have a Nissen fundoplication surgery which was done and uh, after the surgery you can see the top part of the stomach that little bump here this top part wrapped around it and uh, this now has created uh, an anti-reflux mechanism another surgical option is surgery to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter called links and uh, the links device is a ring of tiny magnetic titanium beads that is wrapped around the junction of the stomach uh, and the esophagus so basically at that lower esophageal sphincter and the magnetic attraction between the beads is strong enough to keep the opening between the two closed to refluxing acid but weak enough so that the food can pass through it 
So on the bottom of your screen, you can see uh, the links is placed around the esophagus and uh, that actually prevents that acidic content from refluxing back into the esophagus. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. So thank you guys for watching the video. I hope it was very helpful. And please like, subscribe, comment, uh, share, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.